I'm Dr. Michael Latola. And I'm Megan Strong. In this week's Case of the Week, we take a look at how difficult it is to get path of insertion on an anterior bridge. And in the news, we've got a racy story for you to chew on. And much like many 13-year-olds across America, a dentist's wife is stealing drugs out of a bottle and then filling it back up with water. That and more on today's Jerocide Live. Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 133 of Chairside Live. We've got a great show for you today. Megan, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm recovering from my illness. My yes. ears are popped thanks to the ear popper. Mm -hmm. And um, doing well. How about you? Good. We got a little feedback from a dentist who wrote in and said that he was super grossed out by the way we were sharing that and passing it back I and forth. I don't think it's that gross, especially coming from a dentist who probably sees much more more right. disgusting things well, on like, a daily basis. Yeah, I won't I wouldn't work on somebody um barehanded. Right. Like even um you know, uh, I don't know, even family members, just for some reason having saliva all over my hands and, and picking up things seems weird. But that was just something we were touching like to the surface right. of the nose. It wasn't going two or three inches in. Yeah, so stop the hate mail. I, mean, I felt like it wasn't that gross. I felt like by definition, the fact that you did it meant that it wasn't gross. Exactly. Because I just don't if feel it like... I wouldn't have done it if it was gross. Right. Like if I wanted to, I don't know, like take this straw out of your drink and, and lick it and hand it back to you and have you use it, you I'm wouldn't okay. do it. Nope. Right. See, that's what I'm saying. You yeah. know, you're a good barometer for what's gross and what's not gross. Thank you. All right. We've got an interesting case of the week for you today. We have a dentist who took an impression after prepping an anterior bridge for a Bruxer bridge, sent it in, and now we've got issues, but I have some ideas how digital technology could have kept this from happening. Let's go ahead and take a look at that now. This week's Case of the Week is for a four-unit uh, zirconia bridge, a Bruxer bridge from seven through 10, missing teeth number eight and nine. Um, we're, as a lab, we're not a big fan of double arch impression trays um, being used for bridges. We just see higher remake rates with that. But if you are gonna use one, this T-Lock tray from Premier is a good one to use. I do, as far as anterior double arch trays go, I like this one. It's pretty stiff when you try to squeeze it laterally. And it's called a T-lock tray. You can see some of those little plastic T's there. And it didn't completely engage in some of these areas, but when you fill this with material all the way against the periphery, it really will lock in against these. So this tray is just slightly underfilled here. It's still, it's engaging enough of these where the material's not coming out and it's already been poured. Um, so that's good. You can see we've got two areas of uh, maybe recent extractions. I'm guessing recent extractions just by the depth of the material going into that. So um, it would be nice to have uh, more teeth on here. But as you look at this, I start to think, well, maybe there aren't any more teeth. When this is poured up and we look at the models, um, maybe there isn't any more posterior teeth. And that's why. So in that case, <laughs> that would be OK. If there's no more posterior teeth, what essentially we got uh, on this impression would be the same as if we took full upper and lower with a bite registration. Uh, all we have for a bite are these two, uh, are the cuspids touching? And so that's a little bit you know, difficult. That's kind of a point contact and we really don't have anything else. The doctor has asked us on the RX uh, to open the bite half a millimeter. Um, usually we, we want to specify if it's in the anterior or the posterior, but all we have are anterior teeth connecting. So. I guess we're going to open this half a millimeter, which is going to place the occlusion uh, off the cuspids and onto the bridge, I suppose. I don't think there's any way to open this without removing that contact on the cuspids and putting it all uh, squarely onto the, uh, uh, the Bruxer bridge from 10, 7 to 10 itself. So as we look at the preparations, actually, I'll, let me move this away for a minute. Let's look at it on the solid model here and see what we have. So good retraction. You know, I can definitely see all the way around that prep, not quite as clean over on this side uh, as that side, but pretty close and not bad. The preps appear to be smooth. You know, you don't see any coarse uh, burr marks there, but as you look at it, if we're gonna close one eye or we're gonna do whatever trick we were taught in dental school, if we're gonna view down this one and go, okay, let's get the path of insertion here. I can see the margin all the way around. If you look now over at this tooth, we can't see it. If we turn this one to just be, let's just clear that distal. Now we're missing over here as well. Now this is something that obviously is way easier to see out of the mouth than it is in the mouth. And that's the real challenge is how do we do this 
in the mouth and avoid having undercuts because now we've got to call the doctor and say, well, you know, if it's usually if it's uh, incisal reduction that we're short on, uh, we can do a reduction coping, but axial reduction copings are difficult to kind of pull off when because of undercuts or patham insertion problems uh, like this. And so it could be a reprep, but, you know, the doctor already tried here. It's going to be difficult to uh, to get it right again. And so, uh, as you know, by now, hopefully, when we get a polyvinyl impression uh, in from a dentist, we pour it up. And once we get the model, once we get the solid model and the mounted models, uh, we scan them put them in a box scanner and scan them and then get right into the digital environment because this is where uh, we can really see what's going on in terms of reduction. You might have seen on the on the articulated models that we were short, so it's good the doctor wanted us to open it up half a millimeter. Uh, but we can see what we're talking about in terms of path of insertion problems. We've got over a half millimeter of undercut here and four tenths uh, over on this tooth uh, when we insert it along the most uh, optimistic uh, path of insertion. And so we have an issue here, you know, both of these preps need to be touched or maybe one of them heavily or both of them lightly to be able to get it. But how's the dentist going to know? Well, it's really interesting uh, and we've seen it. I've seen it myself um, when I've done anterior bridges like this and I scan it with a digital scanner rather than taking a polyvinyl impression. So I'm going to use a digital scanner and scan this um, when it pops up on the screen. It doesn't show me whether or not there's undercuts. We're gonna to have to see software advances on the chair side scanners to be able to see this, but you can send it to your laboratory, the digital impression, and your lab will have it two minutes later. And we could have identified this for the doctor from a digital impression because when you send a digital impression, you don't have to pour the models, section them, mount them, and then scan them. We have this instantly when the dentist takes a digital impression. And what we're able to do and what Cindy does with me on my cases is because I still get undercuts, there's there's no like great way to prevent this from happening in the mouth. It's just almost too difficult uh, to do. But when I send this to Cindy and two minutes later, she's identified the undercuts for me. And I'm just showing you one view, but there's other views, other screen grabs she can do showing you where you need to reduce more. It makes it very simple. And the biggest deal about these screen grabs and you can do this with any dentist and any lab that's you know CAD CAM capable, is that the patient's still in the chair, the patient's still anesthetized, your laboratory can send you, here's where it's undercut, here's what the path of insertion looks like, and then rotate it and show you, here's where you need to reduce here and right on this line angle. You know, if you had a stone model yourself, you could probably see it. In fact, it wouldn't be maybe a bad idea to use an alginate substitute, take an impression of the preps, mix up a little slurry mix of stone, pour it up, so you can see the preps out of the mouth, which is infinitely easier than seeing it in the mouth. And it allows you to take a perio probe and view things that you really can't view in the patient's mouth. It's very difficult, but it's easy to do out of the mouth. So if your lab is CAD CAM enabled, lean on them a little bit, because when you take a digital impression and send it into them, they, they have this two minutes later. They can send you a screen grab with the measurements of the undercuts and the exact location so you can see where it is and the patient's still there and the patient's still numb. You can make the adjustments, take another digital impression, send it back to your lab, have them look at it again. That is far preferable to me than to have the patient come back again, take the temps off after you re-anesthetize, touch it up, take another polyvinyl and, and hope it's correct and wait for the lab to measure it and do it again. That's a really dicey way to do it. The diciest way is for us to go make the changes here make the bridge, send it back, and then the doctor try to make those changes in the mouth so the bridge will go down. So this is another great example of what you can do with a digital impression that you can't do with a polyvinyl impression. You can get nearly real-time feedback from your laboratory technician on whether or not these preps are going to draw, and if not, what you need to do to correct it. And then once you've attempted to correct it, you can take another digital scan, send it to your lab, and have them verify whether or not it's correct. It's almost like having the lab technician look over your shoulder as you're prepping these teeth to ensure you get it right on that prep appointment so that you know with 100% certainty that when you take that impression and you put those temps on and the patient comes back next time, these preps will in fact draw and you'll be able to see the bridge. You'll have a happy technician, a happy dentist, and a happy patient. Thank you for that, Dr. D. You're welcome. Now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week's viewer mail comes to us from Germany from Dr. Jan Kaspery and he writes, Dear Dr. Detola, 
Your reverse preparation technique has been a great way for me to improve my preparations. The analytical approach toward the preparation really makes all the difference. For me, there still remains one issue. How do you break contacts without touching the other tooth? And how do you get great margins interproximally as you can't use the round burr there? Also, ShareSide Live, as well as all the other videos on your channels, have been a great source of information and motivation, something that the books just can't provide. Thank you very much for the good work, and keep them coming. Uh, wow, Jan, thank you. That's, uh, that's pretty exciting, getting yeah. a letter from Germany. I don't know. I know it's an email, so it's not like getting a handwritten letter from Germany, but I still find it exciting that dentists are watching um, this program and the clinical videos we do uh, all over the world, that's pretty cool. And so um, that's a great question um, because that is one of the things that initially, as I was playing around with this technique and coming up with it, um, that I kind of stumbled on too. And I was like, I wonder uh, how I'm gonna make this work. So the first question was when you're breaking the contacts, um, what do you do so that you don't hit the adjacent teeth? Um, well, the, the simple answer is don't hit the adjacent teeth. The other answer you know, could be uh, putting something in between there, like a matrix band, like a metal matrix band to give yourself a, a little extra room so you feel a little bit safer. But I tend to use a 56 carbide burr. And as I go in between, I err towards, if this is the adjacent tooth, rather than cutting it very close, I err a little more towards uh, the central part of the tooth. Um, then going right close next to that adjacent tooth. And what you end up doing with that 56 burr is creating a 90 degree angle at that gingival margin, a shelf that once we take the chamfer burr through there, um, it's gonna end up uh, connecting those two round burr cuts. So I try to err to the side of going towards the center part of the tooth and staying away from the two adjacent teeth, knowing that my final chamfer is gonna be a little bit deeper than that 55 or that 56 bird that I'm using anyway, but you could always put uh, a piece of metal matrix in there to give yourself a little degree of safety so that if you nick anything, it's gonna be that metal matrix and not the uh, adjacent tooth. As far as combining the round bird cuts on the facial and the lingual with that 55 cut on the inner proximal, if you look at some of the kind of classic fixed prosthodontic textbooks, like the one from uh, Herr Schillingberg, I just thought I'd throw a little German in there. Uh, so if you look at Herr Schillingberg's book, um, you will see, and he's kind of one of the preeminent crown and bridge uh, teachers in the US, he talks about not having the a same margin all the way around the preparation of a tooth. And especially on an anterior tooth, you know, when you look at the facial surface and then the way it comes back on the lingual, that triangular outline form, we want to preserve that as much as possible on the final preparation. We get good resistance form by having something that's triangular shaped. And if you could fit that round burr in, in between the teeth, and then thus take the chamfer burr around, the more and more we go around, if we're not careful, we tend to take that triangular shape and it turns more into a round peg and now when the crown goes on, there's not gonna be that same resistance uh, to mesial and distal movement or to kind of a twisting moment, a twisting motion when it's on a round peg versus something more triangular. And so what ends up happening is the round burr cuts on the facial and the lingual at the gingival margin. When you go through with the thinner chamfer burr and then the thicker one in or proximally once there's space for it, they do end up blending and it's slightly narrower typically in or proximally. So you have a little deeper facial margin and if you use the round burr on the lingual there as well, and then it gets a little thinner in or proximally and that ends up adding to the resistance form on that preparation. So it's not an issue as long as it doesn't turn, let's say, to a feather edge interproximally. So if you have a deep chamfer on the facial and the lingual and it were to turn into a uh, feather edge interproximally and you were doing an Emax crown, for example, that would be contraindicated for that because we don't want to have feather edge margins. But more or, less it, it, more or less it ends up blending pretty well between the round bird cuts and the chamfer burr cuts. I really don't worry about it at all. Um, I'm starting to use smaller round burrs now that we're doing more monolithic preparations uh, for anterior bruxer, for example, where we can get down to six tenths uh, or eight tenths of a millimeter. And so those smaller round burrs do actually fit in between a tooth. So if you've got a central incisor you're prepping, and a, a lateral and a central next to it, you can actually fit that round burr in between the teeth without nicking the adjacent tooth because of how small it is compared to the typical one that I use. But I don't find the preps get any better just because I'm able to do that. In fact, I really like that 90 degree angle that I get from that 56 interproximally and how I'm able to blend that. I like that it's kind of a thicker one because the, the smaller the preparation interproximally at the margin 
is what I struggle with, is making that a little bit deeper. And we make it deeper because even though uh, Bruxer will tolerate a feather edge margin, it prefers a chamfer, and Emacs uh, you know, prefers a chamfer, uh, needs a chamfer, and prefers even a shallow shoulder. So um, I find it's not a problem to use that 56 carbide to break the contacts, give us the 90 degree angle, and then blend everything with that 856, 016, and 025 burr. So thank you for writing in so much. I'm glad you enjoy the videos, and uh, hope to get the chance to come over and speak to a group of German dentists sometimes, maybe. Jan can make that happen. I would, I that would, would love be to awesome. see that happen. And uh, you said you have another letter or a bonus. I do. So, longtime friend of the show, um, we've got Dr. Ken Winan. Yep. He sent in some. He's been here on set. He's been here on set. We've taken photos together. And um, let's just say that he had an artistic approach to a gift for us. Okay. Oh, nice. Ta Nice. Not Here that we are. that really emphasizes a lot of my best features. Mm -hmm. Now, are my eyebrows like that? Are mm. they really quite that? No. Okay. I don't. I mean, we. I've got. We both have blonde hair. Right. Um, other than that, I'm not sure exactly if this is my exact likeness, but. Um, well, I'm just glad to be in a picture with Cameron Diaz. <laughs> I'm really excited about that <laughs> but yes this was a very nice and that's gift. not bad of you that's not those are the shoes you're actually wearing today yes i am but uh, yeah so one of his patients um made this for us right and usually they'll take in a caricature whatever like l you know facial feature that's the most prominent right and really and exaggerate. really exaggerate that and so i've come to the conclusion that i am in fact cross-eyed <laughs> And then my head does is the shape of an hourglass that, uh -huh. you, that it's it's pulled in between. And it's true, I do have a big five head. Is that, now, did you get that off of my desk? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. So there's uh, he didn't send more than one. No, actually, he no. There are there's there two. are two. Oh, there's yes. one for both of us. Okay, yes. mine's proudly displayed on my desk. Everybody who walks into my office sees it and comments on it. Well, so. I'll have to put it back then. So thank you very much. Can we uh, appreciate uh, getting the chance to have that? Uh, usually, it's us who's sending out some sort. Uh, of little uh, prize or, I don't know, some sort of memento. So it's nice to get one from the viewers. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, and we have a photo to send Jan in Germany, too. And uh, we have a grab bag, if you will. There's, I'm just going to do a quick little shuffle and see what happens. How about this one? That feels so random. Actually, no, we are not sending this to you because I'm very pregnant and apparently lost an eye. That was, uh, yeah, that, that does appear like the 100th anniversary episode where I got hit in the eye with the pool cue. Right, I'm not sure. Was that your, was that your uh, top weight? Was that the most you ever I think weighed? That's, right about I, that picture? I think that's pretty much that's where pretty I much topped it. off. So, um, and that picture is ridiculous. These two, um, you know what? This is a nice photograph for Jan right here. Yep, there, there you're America's sweetheart. There I am, back, not pregnant, just smiling both my eyes, right. and um, yeah, great picture. We'll send that off to you. And I'm uh, America's old white dentist, sitting next to America's sweetheart, so it looks good. Okay. Uh, any news? Yes. We've seen plenty of tactics to get people to take care of their teeth, but this is a new one. NASCAR driver Danica Patrick teamed up with her sponsor, Aspen Dental, to give people a taste of life without teeth in a video that is sure to gross you out. In the video, Danica works in a food truck and shocks her customers when she throws their food orders into a blender. Pulled pork, fish tacos, burgers, all go in the blender. The attempt to illustrate what can happen when people don't take care of their teeth is gross, but hopefully effective. Well, when I was a kid, um, this is back you know, when it was still safe to ride bikes alone and stuff like that, I had a paper route. It was the first job that I ever had. I wanted to be able to have my own money, uh, my dad was a dentist. We weren't allowed to have candy into the house. And so basically I got a paper I, to finance my candy habit. <laughs> so it was like, it, was I love not, that. it wasn't hard drugs. Right. It was uh, Reese's peanut butter cups. It was uh, marathon bars and things like that. And so I would do this paper out, stop by the liquor store after collecting the money. I yep. can't believe I used to go door to door and collect money. That sounds today right. so uh, dangerous. Right. Go to the liquor store. Uh, and bring it all back, sneak it into my bedroom, hide it everywhere. We had an awful cockroach uh, problem for mm -hmm. years in the house. Mom nobody could figure it nobody out could why. Figure it out why. Yeah. And, um, but I used to call on these three convalescent homes. Uh -huh. And so I would go to these convalescent homes and it was back in the day where you would actually take the newspapers to the individual uh, people who were there. And when I was at the convalescent home, they would see you and you'd start to talk to some of the people and you right. start to talk to some of the employees who got the paper. And they had two menus. They had one menu 
for the residents with teeth, and they literally had a whole separate menu no. for the people without teeth. Now, they wouldn't do what Danica did. They right. wouldn't just take the Salisbury steak Taken. and toss it with the salad Pulverize and the dessert it, yeah. into the blender and oh, blend it all up, God. and you go, here you go, old folks. Yeah. They, would, um, they would have two separate ones, and there was basically a no chew menu because people will slowly starve to death if they don't have teeth and you give them steak or chicken oh, or things right. they can't eat. That said, I have a friend whose grandfather had no teeth mm -hmm. and his gums were like leather and he was able to put an almond in between his edentulous ridges and, no. and crush this no. thing with these two leathery ridges Ew. that he called gums he called and uh, it was uh, it was a good party trick it was something to see he could always make a couple bucks in a bar with that uh, but kudos to Aspen Dental for for you know right. doing, a for sponsoring her and getting involved I love sure. seeing dental companies like that I'll be going to some uh, Anaheim Ducks games uh, coming up now there's the, the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs mm -hmm. and you can see Pacific Dental yep proudly sponsoring one of the boards there as well so mm -hmm. I like seeing corporate dentistry get their name on especially with a message like this that if you're edentulous, um, well, pre-implant certainly, sure. but even if you are without teeth and you're just going to try to wear conventional dentures, it is going to make it difficult for you to eat right. with the ability to do hybrid overdentures on four implants. changes things a little bit, but you're still better off with mm, these than right. the real ones. Much easier to be an American. But even without teeth, I guess you could do nothing but suck down in and out chocolate shakes and still consume 8,000 calories a day if you wanted that to. That wouldn't be very painful. Tart eat healthy stuff without teeth. Right. It's probably the better way to put it. Yes. Anything else? Yes. A Pennsylvania dentist was arrested after he allegedly gave drugs illegally to his wife and employees. The wife worked as a sedation nurse at the practice. She allegedly filled the fentanyl bottles with saline solution after using the drugs, returned the bottles to the office, and then used the saline-filled bottles to sedate her patients. The dentist allegedly wrote prescriptions in his wife's maiden name with a false address. Police also say he stole drugs from his office for his wife's personal use. The dentist's dental license is temporarily suspended pending a hearing and his DEA registration was forfeited. Wow, this sounds like a really um, upscale version of, like when I was younger, mm -hmm. I'd come back after a hard day on the paper route and I'd get a slug of whiskey out of my parents. Uh, no, I would. This was high school. Okay. And I would uh, steal some whiskey or vodka. Right. Uh, and then you'd fill, you'd put it back up with water, right? Uh -huh. So they couldn't see, so they couldn't right. see the levels of sure. what you were doing. That's what she was doing, except she was taking the fentanyl bottles home, injecting it into herself, and then refilling it with saline. So, well, that's one thing, but then to go to use the saline on the patients, they're probably not going to go under like they were supposed to when they're injected with saline. No, that salt water is really not going to do much for the pain. I'm feeling pretty bad uh, for the patients. The dentist. I'm guessing was addicted himself or Had was been. certainly codependent on his wife sure. and keeping the employees happy. But that is one of the weirder things. Usually people just still steal the drugs and falsify the records, falsify the logs right. saying that we used it. But to refill the bottles with saline is, is so nuts. It's just like, you know, 12 year old, 13 year old thinking about refilling your parents' liquor bottles. So. Right. And um, I guess the authorities were saying that when they got the search warrant and searched their home, they found like, 50 bottles of this and like just hundreds of bottles of dr various drugs in their home and um, apparently the wife was using the drugs at home with the kid when while the kids were home and she the report I guess said that she would lock herself in the bathroom and use the drugs um, which is a really sad situation obviously but, and addiction's um, awful and uh, and obviously you know addicts lie to cover their habits and sure. but but yeah, the thing about that, and there's always victims of this, even though to the addict it probably seems like a victimless crime. Sure. So yeah, the kids notwithstanding, I feel really bad for the patients who came in for some sort of surgery and were just being injected with watered down fentanyl like it was a local bar. Right. <laughs> trying to water down the top shelf liquor, which I think is uh, awful. So, well, thank you for that. I'm yes. glad that's over and hopefully we don't see something like that happen again yes. anytime soon. All right, that about wraps it up for this edition of Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, Megan, the CSL crew, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Training men. <laughs> Megan's going to make it rain by shaking Hallelujah, her shoulders back and forth. Hallelujah, it's rain. Okay. Dear Dr. Detola, your reverse preparation tip. My nose just plugged up, so try that again. Oh, Sorry. Nose popper, please. <laughs> Dear Dr. Detola, your reverse preparation technique has been a great re what? <laughs> oh, mom, what's wrong with me? Return the bottles to the office and then use the saline. Saline? 
Someone Three. save my lines! It's, it's she allegedly filled the fentanyl bottles with. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> she allegedly filled the fentanyl. Thank you. Cut bottles. With these two leathery ridges Ew. that he called gums.